You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Well, I want you to look briefly again at verse 19 of Philippians chapter 3. You will notice that there are four very short staccato-like phrases there. Paul says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. I had a really difficult decision that I had to make this last week, and, and this was the decision I had to make. Do I take each one of those four statements and make a sermon out of each one? Because there's certainly enough in each one of those to, to warrant an entire message in itself. Or do I combine them into two today and two next week? Or do I put them all together into one message and kind of deal with them all together as a whole? Now, I know that you lost sleep this last week wondering to yourself, what is Jim going to do with those four points? <laughs> and I can tell even now that the, the sense of tension and expectation is killing you. So I will alleviate your fears and tell you we are doing all four of them today in one massive chunk. And we're going to deal with all four of those very brief, very vivid, very colorful, and very loaded statements that Paul gives describing up in verse 18, he says, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Now last week we saw that the Apostle Paul was setting forth his own example as a pattern after which you and I should walk. And we looked at Paul's pattern and we looked at his example that he gives. And then in verse 18 he says, But on the other hand, there are men that we are to avoid. Many of them, he says, do not walk according to the pattern that you have in us, but instead they walk a different way. And last week, just by way of reminder, because we ended with this, but I don't want you to forget this because I want this to be in your minds as we work our way through these four points. There are two types of enemies of the cross. There are doctrinal enemies of the cross and there are moral enemies of the cross. There are people who preach and teach against the efficacy, the sufficiency, the necessity of the cross. And through their teaching and through their doctrine, they undermine the work of God in the cross and thus the glory of God at the cross. So they are enemies of the cross of Christ doctrinally. Those, we saw them mentioned up in verse 2. They were the evil workers, the false circumcision, those dogs, those people who added all of their own works of righteousness and their own goodness and their own moral requirements to salvation and said, I will gain the favor of God through what I do. And for them it was keeping the law of Moses through the dietary requirements and through circumcision. And they would come into the churches and they would say to the Gentiles, yes, you've got saved and yes, you've are a Christian, but the cross is not sufficient to save you. You must also submit to the rite of circumcision. And unless you're circumcised and obey the law of Moses and follow all of the dietary requirements of the law, you're not going to be a completed or a perfect Christian. Those are the doctrinal enemies of the cross. But then there are moral enemies of the cross. And the problem with doctrinal enemies is not their moral lifestyle. They're moral individuals. They're righteous individuals in their outward conduct. Because they try to conform their morals, their righteousness to the law in order to earn righteousness and earn God's favor by being moral. So the problem with the doctrinal enemies of the cross is not their morality, but what they believe about Christ and His sufficiency and ability to save. But then there are moral enemies of the cross. And the problem with moral enemies is not necessarily their doctrine. You can have somebody that is orthodox in every way and believes everything doctrinally perfect, just right down the line, right in line with Orthodox Christianity, and yet they can be a moral shipwreck and demonstrate by their lifestyle that they repudiate the cross and God's judgment of sin at the cross and therefore enemies of the cross because they are overturning with their lifestyle what God did at the cross. So there are doctrinal enemies of the cross. There are moral enemies of the cross. Both enemies of the cross are dealt with in Philippians chapter 3. Up in verse 2, we have the doctrinal enemies of the cross who added to the cross saying it's the cross plus this. Then you have moral enemies of the cross at the end of chapter 3, and their problem was that they subtracted from the cross. The cross is sufficient, but then all of the righteousness and all of the holiness and all of the sanctification that should have went with the cross was thrown right out the window. 
Well, we're focusing now upon the moral enemies of the cross. And I will say that as we go through verse 19, there are some Bible students who see the enemies of the cross here at the end of the chapter as being the same as at the beginning of the chapter. They equate the description in verse 19 with the Judaizers, those who added to the cross. I'm somewhat sympathetic to that, but I think as you see as we work our way through this, Paul has in mind a different group of people. So we're going to look at four marks of an enemy of the cross. First of all, we're going to see that they are known by their doom. Their end is destruction. That's their doom. Second, we're going to see that you can identify them by their deity. Their God is their appetite. Third, by their disgrace. They glory in their shame. And then fourth, by their disposition. They set their minds on earthly things. You can know an enemy of the cross by their doom, their deity, their disgrace, and their disposition. You like that nice outline? It wasn't mine. I can't take credit for it. So let's take each one of those in turn. First of all, you can know an enemy of the cross of Christ by their doom, whose end, Paul says, is destruction. The word end is a word that meant goal or the, the, ultimate, the ultimate culmination of something or a process. Uh, it's used in the New Testament to speak of the end times in an eschatological sense, the course toward which everything is moving, the, court, the point at which something is summed up or has reached its goal, its completion, And Paul uses it here in the sense of their goal, eternally speaking. He's obviously not speaking of something in this life necessarily, because not all enemies of the cross are judged in this life or experience destruction in this life. Paul is meaning something in its, Paul means end and destruction in its eschatological sense, that is, the end result, their eternal destiny. This is the most sobering of all four of these descriptions. Their eternal destiny, Paul says, is destruction. He does not mean annihilation. All of us will live forever, either in a place of eternal bliss or in a place of eternal torment for our sins. Every person ever conceived and born, ever conceived and not born, ever conceived, period, is an eternal being and will live forever, either in the glories of heaven or in the torments and the destruction of hell. And when Paul says... Their end is destruction. He doesn't mean that they're going to cease to exist in hell, that they're going to be punished for a while and then be snuffed out of existence and destroyed in that sense. The word destruction means ruin. Their end is one of ruin. They are utterly destroyed, morally destroyed, spiritually destroyed, emotionally destroyed, physically destroyed. They reach a point of ruin, and that is their eternal destiny. Their eternal destiny is described as destruction. They are destroyed, just like you and I, could destroy this building without making it cease to exist. Do you understand the difference between something being destroyed and ceasing to exist? In the Midwest, we've had the floods the last couple of weeks back there. A lot of things have been destroyed. Have they ceased to exist or been annihilated? They've been destroyed or reached a point of ruin, but they're still there, aren't they? But they have been ruined. That's the sense in which their end is destruction. Now, why do they go to hell? And why do they get eternal destruction? It is because whether they are moral enemies of the cross of Christ or doctrinal enemies of the cross of Christ, they deserve their judgment. The doctrinal enemy deserves the judgment that he gets because he adds to the work of Christ, he adds to the cross, and he lays requirements upon people for salvation that God does not. And he makes people twice as much a child of hell as himself because he adds to the cross of Christ and destroys the work of God doctrinally. But a person who is a moral enemy of the cross of Christ also deserves hell because he's going to be judged for his deeds. He's going to be judged for his deeds. All of us are going to be judged for our deeds if we don't know Christ. Either you're going to pay the penalty and you're going to be judged for your deeds, or Christ paid the penalty for you and you're trusting in Him and His atonement to pay the penalty for your deeds. But hell is what a moral enemy of the cross of Christ deserves because a moral enemy of the cross of Christ takes the grace of God and turns it into an excuse for licentiousness and lasciviousness and immoral and loose living. And you know what their battle cry is? Hey, it's grace. It doesn't matter. It's all covered under grace. We can sin as we please. We can do what we want because it's all by grace. It's not by works. That's a moral enemy of the cross and their end is destruction. They deserve hell. And they're going to get what they deserve in a place of eternal torment. Now, verse 19, that phrase, their end is destruction, could apply to the Judaizers in verse 2, couldn't it? Does a doctrinal enemy of the cross of Christ, does he stand under the curse of God? Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, if you preach another gospel, you're what? 
you're damned, you're anathema, you're eternally condemned. They stand under that curse. To preach or to practice or to promote a different gospel is to place yourself under the curse of God. So they deserve hell for that. But no immoral person, no fornicator, no adulterer, no liar, no swindler, no thief, no gossip, no drunkard, no homosexual, no effeminate will inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because they are moral enemies of the cross of Christ. Listen, even though they may say to you, yeah, I'm a Christian. If they will not submit themselves to God and live in keeping with the calling with which they have been called, they are an enemy of the cross. So you can know them by their doom. Their end is destruction. Second, you can know them by their deity. Paul says their God is their appetite. The word appetite there is the word koilia, and it simply meant a hollow cavity. It's used in the New Testament metaphorically of the inner inner being or the inner man. It's used physically of the stomach or the belly. It is used here in the sense of, of speaking of somebody's appetites. The belly, it's used metaphorically or as a metaphor for somebody's appetites. It doesn't have necessarily so much to do with my hunger for food as my hunger for anything, any type of appetite that you have. The enemy of the cross of Christ makes a god out of his appetites. He serves his appetites. He serves his desires, even his most base desires, so that his desires, his appetite, for whatever it may be, becomes that thing that he is enslaved to, that thing which he is driven by, that thing which he lives his whole life to satisfy and fulfill. They're enemies of the cross of Christ because their God is their appetite. Their God is their belly. And that has become their deity. That has become what they worship. They're not interested in righteousness because righteousness is not what they hunger for. What are they interested in? Fulfilling their sin because sin is what they hunger for. Before you got saved, your God was your appetite. Did you have a desire for righteousness before you got saved? You didn't have any desire for righteousness before you got saved. You had no desire whatsoever for the God of the Bible or the righteousness of the God of the Bible. What you did desire was sin and the fulfillment of every impure, immoral thing with greediness. That's what you wanted. That's what you desired. Their God is their appetite. Now, here's the connection to verse 2. Because those who think that Paul is describing here the Judaizers will say, well, didn't the Judaizers make a God out of their appetite with all of their dietary laws, right? Those things began to take preeminence over everything else. For them, it wasn't about Christ. It wasn't about the cross. It wasn't about the righteousness which comes through faith. But it was about dietary laws. Don't eat. Don't touch. Don't drink. Don't do this. And the dietary requirements and all of the touch knots and the unclean things, those became for them the all-consuming fixation. Well, that's true in a sense, and and maybe it applies to that, but I think Paul would have said that in a different way if he was talking about dietary laws. I think the most natural way of taking that is just to refer to the sensual appetites. It might be your appetite for food. It might be your appetite for vacation. It might be an appetite that you have for rest or for sleep. Did you know that sleeping can become a sin? If you're a sluggard, it's a sin. Your appetite may be for amusement, for entertainment, for the things of this world, for affirmation from people, a spouse. It might be for recognition. It might be for reputation. It might be for material possessions. It might be for money. It might be for fellowship. You can make a God out of almost anything. As Calvin says, the human heart is an uh, idol factory. We just churn them out like crazy. And I could list forever the things that we can make idols out of. Your God is your appetite. What is it that you desire? And don't remove from this its moral elements. There is a moral element to this. He's not just talking about physical appetites in the sense of food and drink. He's also talking about sensual appetites and the living for pleasure. These people live for pleasure. They pursue pleasure. They revel. They carouse. They're drunkards. They pursue the fulfillments of all of their fleshly appetites. Because that has become their God. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Because their God is their belly. You can know them by their doom. You can know them by their deity, that thing that they worship. It's all about sensual, physical, emotional, or some other sort of pleasure for them that they get out of it. And that's what they pursue. That's their deity. But third, you can know them by their disgrace. Look at that third phrase. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. The word glory 
is used in the New Testament to refer to the glory of God or the splendor of His majesty, the summation of all of His being and His attributes. The word glory is also used of a thing in which somebody glories or boasts. For instance, you might say, my wife is my glory. Or my car is my glory. Or this is my glory. Or this is my, this is the thing in which I boast. It can, you can take anything and glory in it. And if you glory in it, then it becomes the thing in which you boast. Or that thing that you take pride in. That thing that you boast about. And I think that's the sense in which Paul is using it. They glory or they boast in their shame. Now here's the question. What does he mean? What does that phrase mean that they boast in their shame? Now some commentators, and I'm going to give you four possible understandings of that phrase. The first two I'm not too convinced of. The third one I'm somewhat sympathetic for. And the fourth one is where, what I believe Paul's talking about. The first one, some people, in, in an attempt to connect this back to verse 2 in the Judaizers, whose focus was on circumcision that Paul dealt with at the beginning of the chapter, they say that the shame refers to that part of the body which bears the mark of circumcision. And since they boasted in their circumcision, they were boasting in that part of the body that bore the mark of circumcision. So it's a shameful thing. It's something they should have been ashamed of, but they weren't. They were boasting in it. And I'm trying to be discreet. And that's as far as I'm going. I'm not convinced by that. I think it's really creative, but I'm not convinced that that's what Paul is talking about. Second, some people suggest that the shame is a reference to the eternal judgment mentioned in the first phrase, their end is destruction. So that all of the things in which they were boasting, that they thought earned them favor before God, they were going to stand before God and be, and it was going to be seen that they were boasting in all of the things that would give them eternal shame when they met their end, which was destruction. Hell is going to be a place of eternal shame. The lost and the unregenerate and those who perish in eternal destruction will be forever shamed. It's a forever shame, forever guilt, forever cast under that shadow of, of all the reproach that bears upon them. Some people say that's what he's talking about. They're boasting in something that will turn out to be that which brings them shame. Third, and this one I'm somewhat more sympathetic to, they suggest that these men were boasting in the very things of which they should have been ashamed, namely, that is, all of their human acts of righteousness. Do you remember earlier up in the passage in chapter 3, Paul says, I did all of these things and I thought they were gain to me, but I came to find out that they were what? Scubalon, manure, excrement, dung. It was one big dung heap. And that should be something that should bring them shame. But all of their acts of human righteousness that they thought earned them favor before God, rather than being ashamed of them as Paul was, they boasted in them. They should have looked at them and realized all of my acts of righteousness are the very thing that's keeping me from being righteous in the sight of God. And rather than seeing all of those acts of human righteousness as the filthy rags that they were, instead they boasted in them. Now that's possible. I'm somewhat sympathetic to that. But the fourth one, and I think this is the most natural way of understanding it, is that they boasted in or gloried in everything that is shameful. And I believe that Paul means it in an ethical and moral sense. They boasted and gloried in shameful things. Now let me give you a bunch of illustrations or examples of this so you know exactly what I mean. I see that I think of this every time I watch a prosperity preacher on TV. What is the mark of a prosperity preacher? Greed. It's greed. It is a mark of their idolatry. It is a symptom of their selfishness. It is covetousness. It is greediness. It is discontentment before God. It is a mark of their unregenerate state and that natural desire to love the things of this world and to find satisfaction in the things of this world. And are they shamed by it? No! No! They glory in it. Because for them, the mark of spirituality is when you're greedy too. When you think God is your bellhop, and He's there to meet your every need and heap upon you all the things of this world, that they think you, then you've really attained. Then you have reached the mark of spirituality. But rather than being ashamed by their idolatry and ashamed by their greed, they boast in it as a mark of spirituality. John MacArthur says the most, says the most wretched sin, the most wretched condition is when a man's worst conduct before God is the very thing that he boasts of before God. We see it outside the church, don't we? Glorying in shameful things. What's the mark of a virtuous 
nation, according to pagans. Now, now understand, I'm going to give you some illustrations of stuff that goes inside the church, but I want you to understand when I talk about pagans, I expect pagans to sin. They're slaves to sin. We understand that. But do you ever see a pagan boast in the things of which he should be ashamed? Because his nature is, is a dog to return to its vomit. That's like a sow having washed with wallowing in the mire. Their nature is sin. Their nature is depravity. And so they engage in depravity. And then they boast about it. And what is the mark of a, of a tolerant, accepting, gracious nation? A nation that has really acquired enlightenment. You know what it is? Abortion is the hallmark and the pinnacle of human freedom. And we boast in that. And we glory in that. And people promote that. And people argue for it. And instead of being ashamed of that, they do what? They glory in it. How about the homosexual or the lesbian that pr- promotes and parades in front of everybody? Rather than being ashamed of it, they glory in it. How about the brazen-faced fornicator at your workplace who will stand there and tell you of all of his or her exploits throughout the course of the weekend? And rather than being ashamed of that conduct, they do what? They boast in it. They glory in it. The world does that. But friends, how horrific is it when inside the church the same thing goes on? And amongst those who claim to be Christians... In what was, what were once Christian denominations, ministers come out of the closet and they are elected to the highest positions in their denomination. And the name of Christ is used as an excuse to promote and accept and endorse and condone that lifestyle as the hallmark of love and tolerance. And they glory in the very thing that they should be ashamed of. What do you do with a church? whose boast and pride is that when we get together, we don't feel like a church. I had a man that I know one time tell me, I go to such and such a church, and you know what I love about that church? We don't feel like a church. When you go there, it just doesn't feel like a church. What? Is that a good thing? When did that become a good thing? And that's a mark of glorying. He glories in that. Or the church that says, when you come here, you don't need your Bible. Don't bother bringing your Bible because we keep sermons short. We keep them light. We're here to entertain you. We're not going to condemn you. We're not going to talk about sin. We just want you to come as you are. We're not going to tell you to repent. We're not going to tell you to turn from your sin. You just come here. You feel comfortable because it's all about just serving you. That's their advertising campaign. That's what they boast or glory in. It's a mark of shame. The risk of being too pointed... Several years ago, there was a church that started right here in our community, and they sent out a flyer to everybody in the whole county. And you know what the flyer said? Our church is all about you, starring you. You come here, it's about you. It's for you. It's the church for you. It's all about you. You come here, we'll serve you. It's you, you, you. And rather than being shamed by such idolatrous, blasphemous, Christ-denying, Bible-hating, humanistic, man-centered philosophy, That's the one thing that they glory in. The evangelical church in our country, friends, is absolutely upside down. The very things that should be causing us shame are the things that we use as advertising slogans, campaign slogans, and to promote our church because evangelicalism is glorying in its shame. That's what we're talking about. And don't divorce this from its moral elements because the same thing goes on in the church when coarse jesting and foul language are used, when we joke about those things that should be shameful to us, you glory in it. They can't boast in that. The mark of an enemy of the cross of Christ is that they glory in the very thing that should cause them shame and bring reproach upon them. You can know them by their doom. You can know them by their deity, by their disgrace. And fourth, you can know them by their disposition. They set their minds on earthly things, Paul says. The word set their mind is phreneo. We've seen this over and over again in Philippians. I think some seven or eight times this word or one of its forms is used. It has to do with an attitude or a mindset or the focus or the disposition of your mind. Philippians has a lot to say about how we think. We are to have the mind of Christ. We are to be of one attitude. We are to have this attitude in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to, we are told all the way through the book of Philippians how to think, what to think about. And Paul's not done. We're going to get a big list of what to think about if we ever get to chapter 4, verse 8, because we're almost there. So Paul gives a lot of attention to how it is that we are to think and what we are to think about. And here he says you are to set your mind or to think about 
not earthly things. Because the enemy of the cross of Christ sets his mind on things that are of this earth. And the word earthly things there is a word that's used to describe the body in which you now are, which is bound to this world and cannot inherit the uh, the kingdom of God. It is used to describe wisdom which comes from below and not from above. It is used to describe this fear of this sphere of sin and death that we are in right now. Paul says, those who are enemies of the cross of Christ set their minds and fix their attention upon this sphere of sin and death in which we now live and all that comes with it. Now, do you understand how difficult it is to pursue Christ-likeness, which is what we've been talking about in Philippians chapter 3, how difficult it is to pursue Christ-likeness if your mind is set on earthly things? You know how difficult that is? What are we to set our mind on? The goal and Christ. But the enemies of the cross of Christ, rather than pursuing the end which is Christ-likeness, pursue an end which is destruction. Because they have set their minds on earthly things, and all that they think about and all that they live for is tied up with this world. As transient as it is, as temporary as it is, as passing as it is, everything that they are about mentally is this sphere of sin and death. So they love the world, and they love the things in the world, because the love of the Father is not in them. They've made themselves a friend of the world, and so they're enemies of God, and they cannot and never will be Christ-like because they set their minds on things of this earth. Now I ask you, friends, if you're pursuing Christ-likeness, how much time and attention have you given in yourself and in your mind to setting your mind on heavenly things? Paul says, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Then and only then will you be able to put to death all the anger and the greed and the covetousness which amounts to idolatry. But not until you fix your mind up there. Set your mind according to that and think upon that. But not the enemies of the cross of Christ. The enemies of the cross of Christ give no thought to Christ. And you can read of the glories of heaven and the blessings of the eternal redeemed in all that it's going to mean for us in the new heavens and the new earth. And that doesn't woo their hearts or stir their souls at all. Do you think about heaven? How often do you think about heaven? Think about heaven just when things are going really bad? Or do you think about heaven all the time? It's not very often that I do this, plug a book from the pulpit, but I will now because it's appropriate, just in case you didn't read the newsletter article, which I think only two of you do read that. I had a book review in there on a a book called Heaven by Randy Acorn. Randy Alcorn, not Acorn, sorry. The Acorn's a different nut. This is Randy Alcorn. He's not a nut. Um, single best book I think I've read in I don't know how many years. Phenomenal. Phenomenal book. It will really go a long ways towards just fixing your mind on the eternal state. You have to have in the back of your mind heaven. The enemy of the cross of Christ gives no thought whatsoever to how his actions here affect eternity. He gives no thought whatsoever to how what he does here influences eternity. Not interested in sharing his faith because he's not, he doesn't care if anybody goes to heaven with him or not. He doesn't pursue righteousness because his mind isn't set on righteousness. He doesn't pursue Christ's likeness because his mind isn't fixed on Christ's likeness. The enemy of the cross of Christ, it's all about here. It's man's wisdom. It's man's philosophy of ministry. It's man's way of doing church. It's just a bunch of boys playing church. It's how we do things here. And it's all about this world, but not those who pursue Christ-likeness. You want to pursue Christ-likeness, you have to set your mind on things above. So you can, those are the four characteristics by which you can know an enemy of the cross of Christ. You can know them by their doom, by their deity, that is the God that they serve, by their disgrace because they glory in the things that they should be ashamed of, and by their disposition, they set their minds all on the things on this earth. Now, in Philippians chapter 3, the whole point of all of that, Paul says, is that you might pursue or walk after people who walk according to the pattern you have in us. These, in verse 19, are the men that you and I are to avoid. If you walk with the wise, you'll be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. If you spend your time with these type of people, and you try and imitate these type of people, if you imitate somebody who is on their way to hell, who is only interested in fulfilling all of their baser appetites at the expense of everything else, who glory in things that bring you shame, and who set their minds on earthly things, then you will be just like that person. And it will be no good for your soul whatsoever. These are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Do we witness to them? Do we share Christ with them? Do we reach out to them? Do we love them? Yes, we do, but you don't imitate them. 
And you've got to understand, even though they may claim to be Christians, they live a licentious lifestyle, an immoral lifestyle of unrepentant sin. They are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who glory in their shame, and who set their minds on earthly things. Now all of that is contrasted with verse 20 and 21. The citizens of heaven. It's a whole other group of people. And we'll start looking at them next week. Lord willing, let's bow our heads together and pray. Father, thank You that You have redeemed us from sin. You have broken the curse and the power of sin for us who, for us who believe. We thank You that You have reached down in glorious and sovereign grace to save such as us. And we pray that the affections of our hearts, the desire of our hearts would be righteousness and holiness and truth and that You may give us the discernment that we need to identify enemies of the cross of Christ and to stay far away from them and their lifestyle and to reach out to them, yes, but Lord, we pray that You would protect us from being polluted by them and give us the grace to imitate those who walk according to the pattern we have even after Paul in the New Testament, that we might honor You through our conduct and through our lifestyle. We pray now that Your grace and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit may go with us now from this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.